All right, hello everyone. So thank you all for joining. Uh, today we're very excited to have uh, Manfred Warner from uh, Google Brain with us. And uh, he was formerly from University of California at Santa Cruz. And among many other famous works, he's well known for his work on the weighted majority algorithm and on learnability and the VC dimension. And today he'll talk about the blessing and the curse of the multiplicative updates. And he'll discuss connections between evolution and the multiplicative updates of online learning. The stage is all yours. Okay. And uh, my uh, point of fame is also I was uh, Mark Herbst's advisor. We had a lot of fun together. Okay. So I think that must uh, be what you're most famous for. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so the thing is that um, I've given this talk many times. Um, there's a certain reason why I give the talk uh, to this group. You will see at the end. Um, but uh, everything changed because a lot of the topic of this talk is is essentially somehow connected to viral evolution as well and to corona and actually it's much easier now to give the talk because i have this example to fall back to you will see in a moment <laughs> it's quite funny um so now i need to find the next okay yes okay so what are multiplicative updates the algorithm maintains a weight vector and the weights are multiplied by non-negative factors um you know, afterwards, uh, the weight is uh, the original weight times the factor. Sometimes there's a normalization. And then uh, you go to the next update. And this is motivated by relative entropies as regularizer for the machine learners. Okay, my screen doesn't advance. So I have a problem. Okay, maybe I use this. Okay. so. So the typical multiplicative update in machine learning is you have a set of experts that learn something on a trial by trial basis. And then SI is the belief in the ith expert at trial T. Okay, so let's say it could be 50%, 10%, it's a percentage. And then the update is something like the new weight is the old weight times e to the minus the loss of that expert. There's a learning rate over normalization. So here's the factor. The factor here is e to the minus eta loss i, the factor for, for the expert i. Okay. Uh, so this is a multiplicative update. Uh, the experts could be in machine learning algorithms with different learning rates. Um, you know, or totally different agents and so forth. Is that clear to everybody? So you have a share vector, which is your belief in the expert, and then you update with e to the minus eta loss and normalize. And the loss can be any loss or is there zero one? Uh, well, uh, if you want bounds, then it cannot be any loss, but uh, uh, for now it's, let's just say it's a loss between zero and one. In the case of, um, if you simulate base, then it's actually unbounded loss. Okay, so you'll see in a moment. Okay, in the nature, weights are concentrations or shares in a population. You could say shares of a virus. Okay, the, the blessing of the multiplicative update is it's the speed. Why? Because you have these factors and you can see that if you multiply by multiple factors, you kind of get exponential behavior. But there's a curse for the multiplicative update. You lose variety. And it's because in some sense, it's too good to be, it, it updates too fast. And, um, and uh, that has to be ameliorated. We'll see in a moment. We'll give four machine learning methods for preventing the curse, ameliorating the, the curse, and uh, discuss related measures used in nature. Okay, and I'm totally fascinated by sort of that we ran into the same problems in machine learning that happen in nature in some sense, okay, that had to be solved in, in a natural setting. 
So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to implement Bayes in the tube. So you can do Bayes rule in your kitchen in some sense. You can also do it in the sandbox. I'll talk in a moment. So, so is, assume um, we have a tube of RNA strands, random RNA strands. Okay, and uh, RNA is a little bit more active than DNA and it, it's actually used in in vitro selection. And then that's what I'm gonna talk about. So let's say you want to find an RNA strand that attaches to, to a protein. So you make a sheet of the protein and you make a mixture of RNA strands, which you can randomly generate using one of those uh, machines. And you tip your protein sheet in there. And uh, then some of the RNA strands attach to the surface of the protein. Now you pull out the sheet and you wash off the RNA that's stuck to the surface. And then you multiply the washed off RNA back to the original amount, unit amount. We call that the normalization. I claim this is base update. So the funny thing about this is it cannot be done with a computer because you have 10 to the 15 RNA strands per liter of soup. Anyway, you could scale this up to uh, uh, certainly to so many variables that computers cannot solve this. And it's some kind of, if you would want to simulate this, it would be a, some complicated three-dimensional simulation that you would need, it's hopeless. So here's a little thing you can do in the kitchen that you can't do with a computer. Okay, so the basic scheme is very simple. We start with a unit amount of RNA, whatever the unit is. Okay, then we do a functional separation into good RNA, the one attaches to the surface, and bad RNA, the rest. And then we amplify the good RNA to the unit amount. Everybody understand this? You still there? Yes. Hello? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, just once yeah. in a while say something. Thank you. Good. So now, how do you duplicate uh, uh, um, RNA? How do you multiply RNA? You have a very tiny amount that attaches to the surface that you washed off. So, well, there is something called PCR. Everybody hears about it in the news now. Uh, supposedly, it was invented by Kerry Moulis by being on an LSD trip uh, uh, in Lake Tao in a hot tub. Um, of course, I do not recommend uh, to do the thing. But um, uh, so what happens is this is a little procedure. Uh, you heat the dub. So RNA is single stranded. It's a little bit more reactive. That's why we use RNA to select for attaching to the protein. But it can be converted to a close relative, the DNA, which is double stranded and it's less reactive. And uh, that's the main information molecule in our cells. Um, so what happens is you convert the RNA to DNA, which can be done easily by an enzyme, and then it doubles up. And then um, the PCR heats the double-stranded RNA. Now they become single-stranded. And now you add these little, high, these little primers to the end. So it's a little double-stranded at the end and otherwise single-stranded. And then the TAC polymerase runs along the DNA strand and complements the basis and makes it into double strands again. So now you started with a single double strand and ended up with a two double stranded. So this is the multiplication. Ideally, everything gets factored, uh, multiplied by a factor of two. There's many YouTube videos about this. Uh, I'm not gonna go over them because my internet is not very good, but you can look them up. It's, it's one of the most important inventions, period. Uh, and the funny thing is that supposedly was invented in a hot tub. Okay, so um, the problem with in vitro selection, uh, which was done already for a very long time in the 70s and 80s and whatever, long time. No, actually not. It was done uh, as soon as PCR was invented. So 85, so after that, sorry. And, um, but, the problem is there are not many interesting uh, functional separations that can be found. 
So what you'd want is you want something that an enzyme that uh, or something that breaks down plastic. So you need a functional uh, separation between good and bad RNA, and that's or 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 that, that's very hard to do. Okay. Also, in the case of uh, uh, let's say breaking down plastic, you don't want to do it with RNA strands. You want to do it with proteins and then there's another translation that's involved and it's very very complicated so for experimental reasons this in vitro selection sort of petered out a little bit but it's really interesting as a metaphor here and to compare to online learning okay good now i'm going to do a, a mathematical description of in vitro selection and i'm going to show you how uh, this simulates the base rule, okay? So let's say we number our un un unknown RNA strands from one to 10 to the 15, okay? Good. And um, SI is the share of RNAi. So the contents of a tube are described by a share vector. S1, S2, Sn, where this was an arbitrary naming. The unit, it, it sums to unit amount. It's a probability vector, okay? It's the percentage, the percentage of each of the RNA strands. Good. Now, you have a protein. The protein is another vector, I claim, because Wi is the amount, is the fraction of one unit of RNAi that is good. Yeah, WI, good. So in some sense, WI is the fitness of RNA strand for attracting to the, attaching to the protein. So my protein is another vector. W1 is the attachment factor of protein one, protein two, till protein N. Okay, good. And now the, um, the combined thing are these two vectors, a share vector and an attachment vector, W, a fitness vector. And we're gonna do blind computation. In other words, we don't know the ordering and the naming scheme at all. We just abstractly said, by, we just name them in some order and then the attachment vector in the same order. And those are our vectors. And now we argue with it mathematically. Okay, so of course, every good research requires an, uh, a strong assumption. And here's the assumption. We assume that the attachment vector, the fitness vector is independent of the share vector. And this is only true when the concentration is very small. Good, now what happens? What's the good RNA? Well, it's the share of RNA one, times how much attaches, what's the percentage that attaches to the, to the protein, plus the share of uh, RNA2 times the fact that it attaches to the protein of RNA2, etc. So it's a dot product, okay? So, and now the amplification is a normalization. So at the end, everything normalizes to one. So you get the following update. SI is the old concentration times, this is what attach times WI times the fitness of um, RNAi, and then over a factor so that at the end, everything sums to one. If I now sum these new SIs over all I, I get one again. Is that clear? Yeah. Okay, good. Now let's do the Beijing interpretation. SI would be the prior, WI would be the probability of the event good. The dot product is the probability of good. So I rewrote the base rule in this way. Okay, so this is sort of the prior, the data likelihood over the normalization. And this is the posterior. Okay, so if you have a little PCR box in your kitchen, you can do this thing in the kitchen. 
Okay, and I actually had my Sandy's parties where people, um, you know, played around with visualizing this kind of stuff in some rudimentary way. Okay, now, so let's see what happens. And this is again an idealized experiment, but actually we have see, seen these kind of curves in the news. And that's kind of very funny. So let's say you have a tube and you only have three strands in the tube. The green one, the dark green one is 0.6 concentration, 0.6 share, the blue one 0.4, and a tiny bit of the red one. And now the fitness factors, the Ws are uh, listed as 0 0.8, um, 0 0.75, 0.9. So what happens, of course, the green wins against the blue and you do iterative updates. This is how many updates you do, 20 updates, 40 updates, 60 updates. And then you see how the concentration change. If you take any slice here, it always sums to one. Good. So initially, of course, green wins, but then blue, uh, red takes over, right? This is sort of a new, this would be Corona Delta. And then here comes uh, Omicron, right? And here is something where uh, you see the fitness of brown versus green is only slightly different, but even though brown takes over, but then it's beaten by this other variant. Questions? Not for me. If there's any question, feel free to unmute yourself or post in the in the chat. And okay, good. So, um, so this is kind of the interesting curve. And we saw this in the news that you always get these S curves when a new virus kicks in, right? So this is the new virus that, that is a higher fitness and it has an S curve. And actually this one, the blue one is also an S curve. It's a reverse S if you would go, okay, one moment. Uh, if you would go to the left, it would be your reverse S if you extend it in negative in time. You can run these updates backwards, at least theoretically. Okay. And actually the brown one would be a combination of two S's, uh, uh, one sort of reverse and the other one forwardly. Okay. Makes sense, yeah. Good. Now, um, Multiplicative updates, the best are too good. Your new vet vector is the old vector times the share factor over normalization. The best get amplified exponentially fast. You can do it with a lot of variables, but the best wipe out others and you have loss of diversity, right? And you see that in the viruses as well. If you have a slight advantage in your fitness and there's a lot of mixing happening, in the population, then you, the, the best one will dominate and wipe out the others, even though it happens at a very large scale. And this happens also, and I will bring this out in, 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 in experiments. Okay, so a simple view of evolution is you have inheritance, you have mutation and select for the fittest with a multiplicative update. And uh, we are going to propose a different view, a different aspect of evolution, of natural evolution. So we're going to point out that the multiplicative updates are brittle. Why? Because a good guy, the good guys win too fast. And um, a mechanism is needed to ameliorate it, the curse of the multiplicative update. And now, now I want to discuss here machine learning methods and methods used by nature to ameliorate the curse of the multiplicative update. Okay. So with, with the plots you've shown, would you say the multiplicative update is quite good to, to model some viruses? Uh, yes, you see the same curves. Uh, it models it to some extent. In the virus case, you don't do the normalize. It depends on what plots they plot. Do they plot the fraction? That's what I do. I plot the fraction of the virus. If you plot the total amount, the curves look slightly different. So you have to, 
Are you, you are you, you have, you have to think about people who got to affected it? Yeah, so you have to, you have to, um, I'm talking about the frequency of the virus in the population, the frequency. If you look at the total amount, then the plots look slightly different, but I plotted the frequency. Makes sense. Okay, good. Now, um, I'm gonna now show a paradigmic experiment that brings out that mixing uh, is a problem. It, 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 it enhances the curve. Okay, so assume you have a hundred different bacteria and you feed it into a nutrient solution. Question, how many will survive after, after waiting for a long time? Well, it turns out about three survive. This is not, a, you know, it, it, it's not a precise argument, but this is typically what happens. One in the muck on the bottom, one on the side, but still no oxygen and one on the surface, right? So three survive. Now I'm asking you the question, what happens? You do the same experiment, but you agitate the cube. How many survive? Anybody can guess? Mark guesses one. Yes, one. He has seen this maybe. Okay, one survives because there's only one niche left, right? Okay, so, and this is the first trick by nature. Um, you don't have this arbitrary mixing. You have boundaries. You have mountain ranges. You have, uh, you know, all kinds of places that are totally protected where you can hide and where there's a subpopulation. Uh, so boundaries prevent the curves. But we, with globalization, we introduce more powerful connectors. We introduce the mixing. So the roads, our roads would be in the, in, in the world of um, information theory with the internet. In the world of uh, economy, it would be trade routes. Uh, in the world of biology, it would be ships traveling and carrying uh, red ants everywhere around the world, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So because of that mixing, we are causing essentially a die out. So this is a very important phenomenon that, our, that humans, it's the most important phenomenon that humans have on the earth. We cause mixing and therefore we cause die out and loss of variety. And that doesn't even talk about, about environmental uh, things so much. It's just focusing on one aspect, mixing, enhances the multiplicative update, competition, die out. Okay, why is this bad? You have loss of variety. You will bring this out in machine learning, why this is bad when you have loss of variety. So now um, people argue often, oh no, I see more variety in the modern world, but there's a paradox go uh, going on. It is true that locally the variety goes up, but globally, I claim it goes down. Let's say, look at languages. We are maybe exposed to more languages now, but the total amount of languages in the world is going down. Or let's say in cooking, we see more variety of food locally, but globally, there's an incredible die out of uh, food recipes happening right now because of the mixing. And everybody wants to eat pizza. Question? So this is a very important, okay. almost sociological or political slide. We introduce roads, we cause mixing. That mixing causes competition because of the multiplicative update. Therefore, we have die out. And it's hard to see because of the paradox. And, and why would a multiplicative update apply to the real world? Like, what's the intuition behind that? Uh, well, it happens, um, first of all, it happens in the virus world. Then it happens, let's say, if you in businesses, you have competition and you have die out. Whenever you have this iterative process where you have competition, uh, you can, you sort of get similar phenomena. Okay, you can see it in the meme world too. Okay. 
No, yeah, of course, I this agree is all phenomenon, but is there is there an intuition why the update would be multiplicative? Like I agree, that's what we have said. Well, it, they are multiplicative because, in the sense that there's fitness, and then the the share would be old share times fitness over normalization. If you look at uh, uh, the percentage, you see what I'm saying? It's a natural yeah, thing. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, thanks. yeah. It it is very general. Okay, now let me show you another experiment, uh, a hypothetical experiment. Um, assume you have three RNA strands in a soup. You don't know what the three strands are and you don't know what their concentrations are, but you know there's three strands in there. And I give you the task, make more of the soup with the same concentrations. Anybody knows how to do it? Yes? Well, um, if you apply PCR, you do iterative, iterative um, multiplication, ideally by factor of two, but very often this is not the case because A might interact with the TAC polymerase ever so slightly differently than B and C. So the factor here might be 1.8, here 1.81, and here 1.9, oh, sorry, 0 0.8, 0 0.81, and 0 0.9, or whatever the factors are, okay? Slightly different. If, so if you apply PCR iteratively, one will win. So that doesn't work. So you need to get a different idea. Okay, good. So what you need to do is, you make one long strand with the right, roughly the right percentages. So you can do this actually, you can take RNA strands, add some pieces at the end, then they stick together and all kinds of technology is there. So you make one long strand, which has roughly the right frequency. And then you, you put a marker at the end, which works for, for PCR, the, the primer attaches to it and the amplify the same long strand many times. You can do that with PCR. And then you can use an enzyme to chop it into constituents because you marked the, the, the cross the, where they attached. Now the relative frequencies might be wrong in the original strand, but they are fixed. And if your original strand is long enough and has roughly the right frequencies, then you can make more of the same soup problem solved. Now, the interesting thing is, this is exactly what nature invented when it invented chromosomes, okay? So the long strand, the individual pieces are the genes and the long strands are the chromosomes. So free floating genes in the nucleus would compete and there would be loss of variety, but there's mechanisms in mechanisms that assure that the chromosomes are always copied completely when you have meiosis, uh, after meiosis. So actually pictorially what happens is if they would, A and B are um, in the soup and they, you apply PCR many, many, many times in the, and they're independent, then one will win. Let's say A will win or B will win. But because A and B compete, the mixing combined with PCR, competition, die out, one will survive. However, if you link them together, then um, you can make more of the same soup. And actually, in some sense, now um, A and B compete with C and D, R and S. So actually the genes on this, once they do the handshake, they lock together, they should cooperate in getting into the next generation. And nature is a funny, funny uh, setup. In meiosis, you mix a little bit and then you're locked together 
in the particular egg and sperm or or yeah or fertilized person in 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 the per, in us and then we use we have to our genes on our genome compete uh, no cooperate to go into the next generation anyway it's a, it's a very interesting metaphor this 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 little experiment i had fun with it so this you cannot do you cannot do independent you have to make a long strand and now actually the ones that are locked together are, they cooperate. In some sense, this connection here between A and B, you can see it as a handshake. Okay. So the general question is, I, I'm fascinated by the fact which updates are possible in the kitchen when you cook or in the brain and so forth. And a lot, a lot of people, um, um, I've been thinking about that, but there's been some recent breakthroughs that will change everything, as I will hint at at the end. So the question is, in particular, in vitro, in vitro selection, what updates are possible? What updates are possible with blind computation? Do you remember when we simulated um, when we simulated Bayes' rule? We did it without knowing the individual vectors. Okay, so now let's do an, a more challenging thing. The second problem, we don't want to attach to one protein. We want to med, attach to four different proteins. Each of them should be, you, you, want, you want to get an RNA strand that attaches or a, 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 small, a small group of RNA strands that does this. And this is a very challenging task because you want to have a set of RNA strands. So how does training go? Um, you you first put in the first RNA uh, sheet, wash off, remultiply. Second sheet, wash off, remultiply. Third sheet, wash off, remultiply. Assume you couldn't do it all in parallel. You have to do it sequentially. So at trial T, you use the T mod Q protein sheet in your process. So now assume you're in the following situation. Um, the fitness factor of a certain protein of the first one is 0 0.9, 0 0.8, and 0 0.96. It's good on the first three sheets, but bad on the last sheets. And then you have a second uh, RNA strand, which is good on the, on the second, third, and fourth. So now to get good attachment, you need a union of both, a mixture. How can you select for a mixture? Well, this has been solved by another student of mine. Nick Littlestone, as you will see. So what you want is you want, you see, you want a mixture, 0.5, assume you have 0.5 of the first and 0.5 of the second, then you get pretty good attachment on all four proteins. So the two strands cooperatively solve the problem. Okay, and this is related to learning a disjunction. So the Are goal these two is- two strands attached? What? Are these two ten strands attached sequ sequentially, so they can yes. cooperate? So I'm saying, I'm saying, in each, for all, whatever the whatever the protein sheet come comes in, the union of fifty percent of this and fifty percent of the other one has has significant amount attaching, no matter what the protein sheet is. That's the point. So you. So you start out with one leader and uh, you have PCR available and you want to arrive at the tube at this tube. And the problem is if you overtrain on if you overtrained on these proteins, then it would favor the first one. And if you overtrain on these proteins, you would favor the second one and wipe the other one out. So there's a there's a problem. How do you do this, right? It's the multiplicative update favors the best, but you're not supposed to use the best. You, the other one is supposed to survive and you want to do blind computation. And it turns out you can do this. You need some, some feedback in each trial, as you will see in a moment. So in, in mathematically, what happens is you want to learn a disjunction, okay? So the, 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 the examples you get, um, you want to find k non-zero components 
you have the fact that uh, you can encode the, encount, the this junction as K non-zero components, and you can use this threshold and then encode this, this junction, and you want to find some kind of a mixture that does the job. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. Yes, so, okay, good. So here's the update. The update is you compute the dot product, how much attaches to your individual sheet, and you check if one over 2K attaches, significant amount of attaches, then you don't update. You don't do the multiplicative update. Only if a smaller amount attaches, do you do the multiplicative update. And this solves the problem. So you have to make the update conservative. If you would keep on updating, even when a lot of things attaching, there's a danger of overfitting, of over, over training on one particular uh, agent and it wipes out the rest. So you don't wanna do that. So therefore you have to use thresholding. And this is kind of a very interesting phenomenon that we discovered this, that Nick discovered this in machine learning. And this could be used to do in vitro selection for multiple goals. The fundamental, in machine learning, the fundamental observation is that the the number of iterations you need is still logarithmic in n. n is 10 to the 15, so it's still doable because of the log. Okay, good. So we showed that the first method in machine learning prevent overtraining with a conservative update. So what you need, if you want to implement this in PCR or with PCR technology, you would need to have a way to measure how much strands you have in a soup, but I talked to some people and said there's some kind of radioactive dye that lets you do this. Uh, of course, they always have lots of grad students, they don't care, but um, so there's a way to do that supposedly. Okay, now notice that this learning a set lets us learn amongst n choose k different concepts, combinatorially many. So we have huge numbers. We have 10 to the 15 uh, agents in the cube, in, in the tube, and then we learn n choose k many concepts, which is another exponential blow up. It's quite amazing. So coupling, instead of doing coupling, which would have, you, would, you could do coupling. You could do for each possible strand, uh, for each possible destruction of size k, make up a separate strand, but that would be combinatorially impossible at some point because of the exponential blow of the of the blow up. So we can replace coupling, which was the previous trick, by thresholding. So now I'm going to show you a next trick, and this was done by Nature first, uh, and I got this uh, in a core. I learned this in a course with an evolutionary biologist, Barry Sinervo, and a, and a uh, economist, Dan Friedman, um, you can cap the weights from the top, which is related to winnow in some sense, okay? So if you are a super predator, super predator means it's a, sp a species that eats like the lion, a lot of different game. So what you do you is you go. Mark? Sorry. Yes. Uh, do you want to unmute yourself and ask the question, Mark? Or should I? Sure. Uh, I, maybe I missed it. Does conservative thresholding correspond to any natural process that you know of? Besides, no. I don't know. I don't know how thresholding is done, but capping is done with a predator. That's natural. The thresholding uh, we invented in machine learning. Good. So now let's say well, you have a super predator. So the um, lion goes, lion king goes uh, on, a, on some kind of a bluff, surveys the Serengeti, makes a histogram of all the species, and then it specializes on the most, the one with the highest bar. That's not how it works. 
what happens is there's a lot of investment of the lion bride, the lion, the lion, the male lions don't do anything, but the female lions, there's a lot of um, investment in, um, in learning how to hunt a particular game and specializing on a particular game. Okay. Therefore, it makes sense to specialize in the most frequent one. And that side effect of having to learn how to hunt has the side effect of you eating off the top bar. So essentially, you cap the histogram. Now, the super predator phenomenon happens in many situations. It happens with insects, it happens with fishes. It's very important. What it, what's important to know is, and this has been verified even experimentally, if you take the predator away, then often one bar goes all the way up and it wipes out the rest. So in some sense, capping ameliorates the multiplicative update. Okay, so what happens is, here's the multiplicative update, e to the minus e to the loss, okay? And you can see that in the multiplic, uh, this is the three dimensional of simplex, you would end up in one of the corners. If you cap, then by, let's say you cap by a half, then you end up in a smaller area. And that has more corners, as you will see. Capping is done in machine learning by taking the probability and redistribute it here so that the ratios are preserved. Um, and there's a combinatorial blow up again. It's extremely interesting. The smaller, the red one, the capped simplex, I capped at a half here, has n choose m corners, where, where the capping is one over m. If you go to the four dimensional probability simplex, which is the three dimensional tetrahedron because of the normalization, you cap at a half you have four choose two corners, which is six corners. You can go in higher dimension, you would have n choose m corners. So the combined update of doing the multiplicative update and capping at one over m selects the best set of m because each corner of the capped simplex is a set of size m. So capping lets us learn multiple goals. It learns the best set of experts of size M. Okay. And actually, I'm going to hint at the end the matrix version of this updates where you don't you have a semi-definite probability simplex, et cetera, et cetera. You run a best set of K directions. It was used to with another student, Dima Kuzman. We used it to do BCA. How to cap in, in vitro selection? Um, I don't know. It could be that there could be a, you introduce a second effect. If you have a lot of concentration of a particular uh, species, they start somehow eating each other or something like that. Uh, uh, you can also maybe do it at the, at the RNA level. Yes. But in machine learning, we used it by capping the share vector. One okay. friend, yes, a question, right? So it seems in nature, it seems like you know the exact mathematical model for how capping works could be implemented in many many ways. Is what you're referring to by capping here uh, correspond to some sort of uh, projection to the uh, uh, simplex where the yes with, with box constraints yes. Yes, so in nature, it's done by having a super predator. We do it by, uh, by uh, capping. We do the multiplicative update and then we project subject to the capping constraint. But and the projection you... is done with a relative entropy regularization. Yeah, so, so I, but are you going so far as to say, to think that there's kind of a, a naturalistic process like the super predator could be interpreted as that particular way of capping. Yes, 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 yes. And okay. nature seems to use 
normal relative entropy as regularizer because these multiplicative updates are motivated using relative entropy of regularizer. Capping, you can also view it as constraints, minimizing a relative entropy subject to constraints. So why nature plays around with relative entropies and entropies as regularizers, we don't know. And uh, I'm totally fascinated by the subject. I'll get to that in a moment. Okay, so this is capping. Now the infamous Mark Herbster comes in. So now assume you have an initial, initial uh, uh, tube with have lots of different strands. And after a while you have loss of variety, some selfish strand manages to dominate without doing the wanted function. So what you do is you mix in a little bit of the initial soup for enrichment or do sloppy PCR and you can do it in nature does it by mutations. And we ran into this in the following situation. Let's say you want to um, um, have a computer algorithm for solving, for spinning down the disk in your laptop. So you have experts, you have a fixed set of timeouts and you watch and if the timeout is exceeded, you spin down, okay? So the master algorithm maintains a set of weights, share vectors for each of the different times. And now you do a multiplicative update. The share is updated by e to the minus e to the energy used by the timeout over normalization. That works pretty good. And you predict then uh, you, the, the timeout the algorithm uses would be the weighted uh, average of these timeouts. Good. So that works, except if you have data that changes over time. If you have short spurts, of the request sequences, then you should have a long timeout. And if you have long, uh, long idle times, these are the idle times in black. If you have long idle times, then you should spin down immediately and not waste your time waiting. So you need different timeouts for different request sequences. And what you do is you do the fixed share to uniform pass invented with Mark Herbster. You do a multiplicative update you scale down your current shared vector by a fixed fractal, let's say 99%, alpha is 1%, and then you mix in a little bit of the uniform. So maybe nature uses mutation for the same purpose, but you need to do this. You need to make your multiplicative update robust that way if data changes over time, otherwise you're totally screwed. Okay, a better way to do it is, it's called, we call it sleeping, you mix in a little bit of the past average weight vector. Did this together with Olivier Bousquet and later on with uh, Wouter Kuhl and Adamski um, uh, from Royal Holloway. Uh, so you mix in a little bit of the past average weight vector. And this has beautiful effects of uh, you. It's very good to switch back to the previous, previously good weight vector. It has a long-term memory. Okay, and it has a sleeping paper uh, interpretation. We wrote a paper called Putting Bayes to Sleep. Okay. So now um, there is a way to explain this sleeping update or an alternate to this uh, mixing in a little bit of the past average that I want to explain. So what you do is you take your soup you make two you make two tubes a, an, a, an a la, awake tube and an asleep tube. In the awake tube, you run the multiplicative update. The sleep tube, you just don't do anything. You just pass through, and then you swap a little bit between the two tubes. Beta a fraction of beta goes over here, and a fraction of alpha goes over there. And now you do again a multiplicative update. Here you do a pass through and then you swap a little bit. Now I claim that this setup has a long-term memory and it's totally fascinating. Okay, one moment. So here's the update in math. You have the initial tube. The left one is gamma, one minus gamma. Then you do the multiplicative update. The right one just passes through. And then this is the soup exchange. It's a very minor thing. Now here's what, hap what happens. Um, 
I made up an artificial experiment where for a while expert A was good, then expert D was good, then strand A was good again, strand D, strand G, strand A, strand D. Now assume this is sort of the best partition sort of God's algorithm that you would have um, and assume its loss goes up very slowly. An arbitrary expert's loss goes up very fast. This is the loss. Now here, the, here is the multiplicative update. The multiplicative update is in dark blue. It has an initial bump until it learns A. Then it's when D comes along, A is still burned into the weight space. Nothing else is there. It wiped out everybody else. So it A behaves very bad. Then it remembers A immediately because it's only consists of A and so forth. So this update is no good because it just learns this particular thing. If you do fixed share the uniform past, then what happens, you have a fixed bump for each segment. In other words, whenever a new segment starts, because of this lower bounding the weights, mixing in a little bit of the uniform, you can still pick it up fast and learn and eventually learn uh, whatever the current best expert is. Now, the one with long-term memory, which is you mix in the past average or you do the two-track model, has this beautiful behavior that it has a big bump when you see a new segment, but when you see a segment that you have seen before, you relearn faster. So relearning A faster, relearning D faster, relearning A faster, relearning D faster. And this is a totally fascinating phenomenon because this long-term memory happens all over nature. It happens, for instance, when we want to learn a song, when we know a similar song, we can learn it faster. It happens in birds. So it happens in our brain. It happens in biology. It happens everywhere. So it's a very fascinating phenomenon that this showed up in machine learning by adding another line of code. Essentially, these are very trivial uh, updates. Now, what I plotted here is I plotted the log of the weights. So the eighth weight goes up very fast. Then it goes down to this intermediate layer where it go, decays only very slowly. And when it's needed again, boom, it's pulled up very fast. So here it's needed again, boom, it's pulled up very fast. Okay. And now here we already learned two guys that did well in the past that are on the hit in the sleeping track, A and D. Okay. Now, if you look at the concentrations on the sleeping side, everything happens slower. The pickup is slower and the decay is slower. The pickup is slower, the decay is slower, right? But you see that once A was good, it stays at that higher level and then can be picked up faster. Because at this point, a small amount leaks back to the active track and then it can do the job. Questions? So is the intuition that by introducing just a small amount, then very quickly you're able to recover what you had already learned? Yes, so what happens is, again, number. what happens is, if you were ever good on this side, things leak across and they sit around over here at a very long time, but a little bit always leaks back. So when it's needed again, it leaks back and gets picked up very fast. Yeah, but how do you explain that on the right hand side, once you learn A and then you learn B, like do you store both? A bit confusing. Okay, okay, okay. Let's say if you learned if you learned A really well, then eventually over here, A will go up. Mm -hmm. While you learn B or some other expert, because you just do a pass through, it gets destroyed on the active side, but on the inactive side, on the sleeping side, it sits around. But then it leaks back and is picked up again when it's needed. Yeah, but somehow you have only two tubes, but you have three three variables. So, 
how, how does it work for? I'm going to have 10 to the 15 variables, and I run this with 10 to the 15 variables. Oh, okay, okay. okay. Right? Okay. I have 10 to the 15 variables. A fraction of my soup goes here. A fraction of my soup goes here. I do my multiplicative update. But if any of the RNA strands over here is, is doing very well, it will leak back to the asleep side and is stored here so that it can use it again. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Thanks. OK, so what I've shown you is that nature machine learning method was conservative update, the upper bounding the weights, lower bounding the weights, and the sleeping tricks. All of those introduce, in particular these ones, introduce the long-term memory. In nature, we have also stuff like, you know, we'll keep a lot of old stuff around on, on the, on the uh, chromosomes, old DNA, and maybe that can be activated later on. So the question is whether that implements the long-term memory. It happens in nature, of course. If you, if you had a species and it once learned how to act, act in a certain environment, for a while you would move it to a different environment and then you move it back, it will adapt faster. So the long-term memory is there. The question is how it's implemented. So I discussed sort of machine learning methods and here are nature's methods, boundaries, coupling, super predators, mutations. All of them ameliorate the multiplicative update. And then the long-term memory is something special. Okay, in summary, Multiplicative updates converge too quickly, their blessing, it, which is their blessing, but they wipe out diversity, their curse. Okay. Changing uh, conditions require use, reuse of previously learned knowledge alternatives. Um, and the diversity is a requirement for success. So a lot of mixing is extremely dang dangerous because you cause die out and then you're not adaptive anymore. So and a mechanism is needed. And um, I have a bunch of final questions. I did it with two tracks, the two, three tracks help. And this was partially analyzed by um, a paper by Herbster and it didn't make a big difference. Um, the bounce didn't bring out a big advantage, but maybe something simpler is good um, could be explored when you look at this. It's very hard for me to. Uh, move my, okay, forget it. I don't want to go back. Okay, if you go back to the two track model. Um, What happens is my cursor doesn't move. So can't move back. Okay, forget it. So, um, the, if you do the two track model, adding a third track didn't make a big difference, but you might add a second track using different swapping rules and have multiple swapping rules in parallel. And that might be uh, interesting. The other thing is um, there is tempered versions of the multiplicative updates where you take the exponential and the logarithm and you flatten them out. And the temperature t equals one corresponds to the normal multiplicative update, t equals zero implements gradient descent. And I do not know whether these are used, but there's been many papers recently on this update. Uh, and it's, it, you get to it by the tempered relative entropy. Now, there's another question 
there is a matrix version of this multiplicative update. And I do not know whether that is used by nature. Now the share vector is a, a positive definite matrix, sort of quantum physics. And then you take a matrix log, you subtract the gradient, and then you matrix exponentiate and divide by the trace. This was used, it homes into the largest eigen direction. It was used to do PCA algorithms. And the quantum relative entropy is now the regularizer. I do not know whether those are real, uh, in, in, whether they are used by nature. So I'm asking these questions, is the tempered version or the matrix version, which has many, many important mathematical properties in good in machine learning, are they implemented in nature somehow? And I don't know. Now, you have to understand also neural networks, the big success of artificial intelligence is running backprop, gradient descent on deep neural networks. Okay, and no big successes have been reported yet on using multiplicative updates on neural networks. Uh, but this is all in the flux right now. And that's why I went to Google. Um, we figured out a way to simulate multiplicative update as gradient descent and also the other way around. So multiplicative update as gradient descent is important because um, uh, backprop is hardwired in all of these um, software packages. And the other way around, in the brain, you cannot have negative values, negative concentrations. So you need to simulate um, gradient descent using multiplicative updates, it seems. And we recently found a way to do that. So this is currently a very active research area and a lot of changes will happen from this kind of thinking, uh, from comparing additive and multiplicative updates. <laughs>